was thinking about inventing a new kind of generator. And whenever I think about something like this, of course, my main priorities are it ought to be simple to build and it ought to be cheap to build and just about anybody can do it. That's the way I think about it. But there are some principles behind generators that I think it's probably a good idea to know because then it will help understand and help show why certain things are done a certain way. Now, when you think about generators, you're also thinking about motors, because it's not that they're two different machines. They are, in fact, absolutely 100%, 1 million, 5 billion, 1 billion, stick a lillion percent the same. The only thing that differs is if you spin one, electricity comes out. If you put electricity in, it will spin. They have the same principles behind them. It's just in reverse, if you like, but they're exactly the same. They're an arrangement of wire and magnets. Now, everybody knows if you move a wire in a magnet, you'll get a current. If you put a current in a wire while it's in a magnetic field, it will move, and that's why they're identical machines. And they're governed by that extremely simple principle, and of course, Faraday is the guy that we usually accredit this to. Now, there are three factors that are considered important when it comes to the design of any generator. Because that voltage that you push through a wire depends on three things. It depends on the length of the wire. So you have a magnetic field of a certain size. If a small wire you put that through, you get a small volt voltage. Big wire you put that through, you'll get a large voltage. Clearly, it also depends on the strength of the magnetic field. The bigger the magnetic field, the higher the voltage. The longer the length of wire, the higher the voltage. People often think about this in terms of the number of turns. Actually, a turn of wire is a bit like a single length of wire connected in series. That's all it is, and that's why the voltages add up. So it's the length that you're interested in. The number of terms are the same length connected in series. The last thing that really matters is the speed at which you do it. So the length of the wire, the strength of the magnetic field, and the speed with which that wire passes through the magnetic field are what determine the voltage output of absolutely any generator. The wire has to be moving, it has to be cutting the lines of magnetic field. If it's not, and uh, nothing happens. You can just hold a wire in a magnetic field if you like and you'll see nothing. If you move it, you'll see something. It must be cutting through a magnetic field. Now, it's not common to have a straightforward wire, two magnets, and pass the wire in that direction. What we do is we make them rotate. When they rotate at the top, then they're not actually cutting any magnetic field. The maximum number of lines they will cut is when they're rotating through a quarter of a turn. Half a turn, they're at the bottom of the field and they're doing jack. Quarter, three quarters of the way around, they're at another maximum point. And so something happens there as it rotates and it cuts through those fields. And it's to do with the angle at which it hits the lines of magnetic force. So we need one other factor and that is the sine of the angle. So the sine of the angle times the length, times the speed, times the magnetic field, give you the voltage a generator will uh, generate. Okay, so let's get the world's most powerful magnets, an enormous amount of wire, and spin it as fast as we can in that magnetic field, which have the world's greatest generator. Well, yes, we would, but of course, You've got to ask what about the amps. Now, amps are a funny thing, and it's often best to think about amps in terms of water. If there's nothing for the water to flow in, it's not going to flow. If it's got something to flow, but there's a big bung in it, it's not going to flow. And it's the same with amps. Amps need a circuit. And if that circuit has too high a resistance, they can't flow. You need to push them harder against that resistance to remove that bung, in which case they will flow. So if you like, Voltage is set by the parameters of the machine. That is, length of wire, or if you like, number of turns, pretty much the same thing. Strength of the magnetic field, the speed at which you turn it. They will be the parameters that govern the voltage. The amps are the amount of push. Now you have to remember that a generator 
is a machine that takes mechanical energy and converts it into electrical energy. You want more electrical energy out, we have to put more push in. Of course, there are mechanical limits to things. If you need to push too much out and your axle isn't thick enough so you can't put any more mechanical energy in there, then you're just going to break the machine. And those are the limits that limit amps. The build of the machine, the amount of force you can put into the machine are going to limit the amps. The machine design itself, that is the length of the wire, the strength of the field and the speed at which it turns, limit the voltage. Now there are other things about it of course, like thickness of wire etc, but essentially they are the important considerations when it comes to any generator. Now you might have noticed that there's been no mention of our geometry of the engine or efficiency of the engine. And that's because geometry is really all about trying to maximise those three values. For instance, axial flux. Axial flux tries to keep the wire in the field lines for as long as possible because it's radial flux, of course, at 0 and 180 it's not cutting any lines. So axial flux tries to put it so the wire is always cutting lines. Efficiency is really down to the quality of the engineering more than anything because, of course, a magnetic flux drops off by the square of the distance, so the closer you can get it, the tighter the tolerance is, the more efficient it's going to be. So you can buy these things. They're superbly engineered and they have incredible efficiencies and they're really expensive. And that's the problem with engineering. As the tolerance improves, then the price goes up by the square of the tolerance so that you get ridiculous prices for beautifully made machines. Now that's all well and good and fantastically wonderful, but I'm interested in people being able to build their own machines, in which case, like with most things, you have a trade-off. There's always a trade-off concerned in these things, because we're not talking about amp theory, where there are no trade-offs, we're talking about practical reality, when there is always a trade-off. And the trade-off is usually between cost and performance. If you build something cheaply, the chances are the tolerances are not going to be great. So what you want is an acceptable performance for the amount of effort and money that you put in to create something so it does a reasonable job for the effort and money that you've put in. And that tends to be how I think about things. I'm not looking to make the world's most beautiful machine that cost me a couple of hundred million. I'm looking to make something from bean cans that we can all make. And so that's where I'm coming from. So I was thinking about that. How could we go about taking something like this, which is the yoke out of a standard induction motor, and use that to make a generator that um, didn't really require a tremendous amount of engineering to build it, that would have an acceptable performance, and instead of it being radial, change it to axial. So that's what I'm thinking of, and those are why I'm thinking of it. Now, if you're thinking about building your own generators, then certainly those, I would say, are the principles you need as guidance to help you think about it. Mm. Amazing geometric designs, things like the Rodan coil, for instance, um, to my mind are a little bit of a waste of time. They don't really affect anything that a generator would affect, whereas things like the axial flux do because of the principles involved. This is the outer case of a radial flux motor, a normal motor, and as you'd expect, it's a lot of silicon steel with these little fingers sticking in there, stacked up, and this is where the coils go. So I peeled off a couple of those, and this, what you get is this. Now, two of those together are about a millimeter thick, so I peeled off four, giving me a two millimeter layer. And what I want to do is cut every second one out of those fingers. When I've done that, what I've got are these. We've got two metal plates, 12 of these little prongs pointing into the centre with a good ring of silicon steel around the edge. Now if I put two of those together and rotate a magnet in there, then I'm going to be able to swap this and this, north-south, north-south, creating a field going in that way, the axial direction, as long as I rotate some magnets in there. So, what I need is some magnets.
So what I've got is an acrylic disc, and in that acrylic disc I've drilled a whole lot of 6mm holes, 24 of them, 15 degrees apart. And the reason for that is there's 12 of these, 30 degrees apart. So if my, mag if my acrylic disc is there with some magnets in, and that magnet has the north face pointing here, then in that position all of the norths point to the little fingers, which means that the orientation of that will be north. Move it 15 degrees, then all of those will change to south. The south will now be pointing at that, and the orientation of the field will be south. So every 15 degrees of rotation of the plastic disc, I'll be able to flip the magnetic field in there from north to south and north to south. And of course, if I put another one on there, this will be in the opposite rotation. So although that's north, that'll be south, and so on. And what I'm starting to get, obviously, is a generator, because what I need to do then is wind a coil around here, and that should generate. Let's get a whole load of six mil by three mil magnets and stick them in my acrylic disc. Okay, so I've stuck a load of those, six millimeter by three millimeter, in my acrylic ring. And they're really cheap, actually. It's about a fiver for a million. Uh, I mean, not, I think I paid uh, about 10 pounds or 120 of them or something. Anyway, that's my rotor done. Now, with this bit, what I've done is I've cut a bit of acrylic and put a um, bearing in there. That glues on there, and then we glue a plastic ring on it, and we get that. So that's only the piece of metal plastic ring, which is five millimeters deep, and then a bit of acrylic with a bearing. And of course, our rotor goes in there like that. Then we take our second piece here and fix that in line on top like that. Glue that whole thing down, put that on, and we're ready to wind our coil. So let's glue that down. And there's it put together. Now, I put 200 turns of wire on it. I'm not sure of the gauge, but it's about 0.1 millimeter thick. And we're going to give it a spin up, see if we can get anything out of it. And for that, I've got this headlight. Awesome, eh? This takes three AAA batteries, um, so it's putting out about 4.5 volts or something. It's round about 70 to 100 milliamps, which is pretty awesome from this, okay? Now, it cost me probably a pound or less to make it, and if you want a similar kind of output from a stepper motor, you're probably looking at about 20 pounds or so just for that motor. Now, I'm not claiming any wonderful efficiencies. Remember, this is an idea, and this is the prototype of the idea. I'm pretty impressed at how it worked for a lashed together prototype. The idea is that we've got an axial flux generator where we're using that crab claw alternator as um, an in-runner with uh, magnets. The whole thing's, of course, made out of plastic. It gets its win because we only had to put one coil on it. In a normal motor, remember, you got something like 24 coils that you've got to make and get in there, and that makes them a bit labour-intensive, makes them a bit expensive. Here, we're just putting one coil on it and getting a similar result, so that's going to cut down the cost tremendously. The bulk of it, of course, is made from plastic. It's not made from steel. So there's a lot to be learned from this little prototype, but the simple fact that it works, not that it does an awesome job, because it does do an awesome job. That uh, surprised me how good that is. Makes me want to build a bigger version. And of course, there are other things to bear in mind. We've got a uh, north on this side. If we put another magnet here, and then another layer, another magnet, another layer, we don't need to duplicate these layers up time and time again. We don't need two layers, we can just put one layer of steel in there. So the whole thing is really quite thin. This is about a centimetre thick. So we've got a centimetre thick generator. Now remember, with generators, the velocity of the magnetic field changing has a big impact. And we've got this on a disc. Because it's made out of plastic, of course, we could make that disc really, really big, in which case we'd get a high velocity of the magnetic field changing, and we could do that really easily. So it's very adaptable to something like that. So I'm pretty pleased with actually how that worked out. 
There's the prototype, if you fancy giving it a go, I've given lots of details. If you have any other questions, of course, put them in the comments and I'll do my best to answer them. But there's the prototype, works brilliantly. Probably going to build a bigger one because I think this is a generator of the future. Anyway, hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching and please do remember to like and subscribe.